Uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, we will be having our online panel discussion hosted by Ashoka and the MasterCard Foundation via Google Hangout. Um, today's panel will explore the future of learning in Africa. My name is Lindsay Farrell, and I'm the program manager for the Future Forward Initiative, and I'll be moderating a conversation today featuring panelists joining us from around the continent. Over the past several months, the Future Forward Initiative has explored the issue of youth employment in Africa, showing how African innovation supports youth livelihoods. We've also explored the role of change making in the African work environment of the 21st century. You can catch up with past conversations online by going to changemakers.com slash future forward. We are seeing that the marketplace of the 21st century requires young African job seekers to be open, innovative, and adept problem solvers who contribute towards the future of the continent. Education plays a key role in preparing young people for that marketplace by exposing them to the right learning experiences. Today we have a diverse panel from across the continent. Uh, from Nigeria, uh, from Mauritius, and hopefully if we can find them from Uganda and Kenya. Uh, youth educators and innovators coming together to discuss the future of learning in Africa. As in previous webinars, you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Youth Forward. It's Africa Youth FWD. We'd love to hear your comments and questions that are being asked during the panel. And feel free to ask um, questions too on the on the chat in the in the Google Hangout uh, screen. We'll try to weave them into the conversation. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's event. Uh, can each of you please introduce yourselves and tell us how you're making impact for youth in your communities? Um, Alyssa, would you like to start? Sure. Okay, I am Olumide. Oh. Okay, go ahead, Olumide. Go ahead, yes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm Olumide, Olumide Adelaide. Um, I run Twim Academy. It's a vocational school that raises entrepreneurs in the media and creative arts. Great. Alyssa? Uh, hi, my name is Alyssa. I am a curriculum designer and facilitator for ALU, which is a tertiary education institution seeking to establish 25 African universities across 25 African cities. Teresa? Uh, hi, my name is Teresa Michael. I am regional coordinator at Mommy Africa, an organization, a non-profit uh, social enterprise for the development of youth uh, in terms of education, social inclusion, and employment services. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Great, great, great. Um, so I'm just going to start with a real softball question. Maybe it's not that softball. Um, that uh, I, basically, if you could tell, I'm going to just have each of you talk about what are the most exciting new approaches and education that you're seeing in the area, subject, the field that you're that you're working in. What do you think is like the the best and most exciting new things that that are happening in education in Africa today? Alyssa, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, the best and most exciting um, ventures in Africa are those that are trying to solve the problem of an employment and do it in, doing it in very creative and practical ways. Um, the organizations that seek to that look at the context of the country and then build on that um, on those on those. Um, benefits. So it's the kinds of institutions that, that like Olu's who look at media and the arts and see this booming entertainment industry in Nigeria and then seek to help people um, find employment by giving them the skills they need in that context. It's you know institutions like my own who, who are <laughs> maybe trying to tackle it on a, on a broader level but um, are thinking about how can we give students the cutting edge engineering um, background so that they can go and look for jobs of the 21st century. How can we tackle issues like urbanization, this, these massive cities that are growing um, mm -hmm. way faster than any of us are prepared to deal with? How can we provide students with an education that will give them the skills to tackle um, Africa's most demanding challenges? 
So for me, the, the innovations in education that are, are most interesting and most exciting are the ones that are dealing with the continent's challenges and doing it in creative ways. Teresa? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I agree with um, Alicia, and at the same time, I want to add that for me, those that are really making the change are those, you know, taking the young people off the streets, taking them away from violence, taking them away from, you know, the frustrations they, they experience after school without any form of, you know, forward movement, and bringing them into free spaces, safe spaces, helping them to realize their own strengths, their own inner strengths and what they could actually do, not just for themselves, but for society. As a matter of fact, taking those, you know, the young people off these hands and turning them into change agents who are reaching not only themselves and their own families, but their peers and actually becoming employers and, you know, peer employers. I think that's where, you know, we, we really need to be fully. Yeah. Teaching young people to actually employ themselves and others. And Yes, and to employ others. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of them. You know, the, the statistics for a country like mine, Nigeria, can be depressing at times. They say that unemployment, youth unemployment, um, accounts for um, like 50% of the youth population. So, like, half of us are unemployed. I, I don't know how realistic that is, but it's pretty bad. Now, if people go to school and at the end of the day they end up being unemployed then that means that the educational system is not being very useful and so the most innovative um, organizations are the ones that are finding ways to make education relevant because really education would be irrelevant if it's not helping people to get jobs mm -hmm. Because, you know, you spend just a little bit of your time outside of school working. Mm -hmm. And so if mm -hmm. school is not preparing you to get employed, then school is not being useful. So I think that it's important that we encourage more and more organizations to look at new approaches to solving the unemployment problem because that's really the purpose of school. So... Um, Given that that we that we're we're sort of seeing a mismatch between education and employment, and in fact, in February, we had a, a meeting in Cape Town, South Africa, which was supposed to be about unemployment, and ended up really being taken over by the fact that people are very frustrated with the educational systems and how they're preparing young people to um, to to find jobs, to find livelihoods, to to have meaningful and purpose purpose driven lives. Um, and so given that, what do you think are some of the skill sets and learning experiences that uh, we should be giving to young people in Sub-Saharan Africa um, in order to address that mismatch? Like what would be sort of the key skills um, that either your organization is promoting or that should be promoted um, more generally ac across the education systems? Uh, Olumide, do you want to start since you're just finished? Okay, I, I, I think that um, something like um, creative thinking is extremely important. Um, you know, education is so formal that sometimes people actually don't think creatively. It actually stops people from thinking. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we need to create ways of helping people think creatively and that's where they are in, they're in very good positions to, to, to solve the unemployment problem. In my organization, for example, we, we work on you know media and creative arts and stuff like that and you'd be surprised that many people who are graduates of higher institutions you know in fields like maybe engineering and stuff like that come over and then they discover completely new sides to themselves and then people who all along were unemployed suddenly start realizing things that they can do with just little teaching and then they start doing those things and at the end of the day they become <laughs> employed you know they get self-employed and they make money so I think that creative thinking is one of the basic um, skill sets that we need to promote. Um, I think also that the educational system should encourage people to um, to get current. Um, unfortunately, 
well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from the Nigerian perspective now. Um, most of the information that we pass around within the educational sector is outdated. And somehow it has a way of helping people to stay in the past. So we need to keep people abreast of what is happening in the present and looking at what the future would look like. Mm -hmm. So I think the educational system should be preparing people to do that. Okay. I, I would like to just piggyback off of Olu's comment in that part of one of the skills that I think is most needed are critical thinking skills, which has its, its connections to creativity. The idea that we want people who can think outside the box. We want people who can look at a problem and look at and analyze it from many different angles. And I think employers would be um, making a mistake if they underestimated the power of this skill. Because no matter what you teach someone, critical thinking is embedded in every, um, in every job. And so we want students who, we want to give students the skills to think, to synthesize someone's arguments, to be able to add, to build upon those arguments and then think about situations contextually. Um, and on top of critical thinking, I would think communication skills are, are very much in demand. The ability to write, the ability to present yourself well and communicate your thoughts and ideas and be able to engage with people um, in conversation. Um, uh, over and over again, employers are telling us that communication is one of, one of the skills that they look for immediately in any type of interview and vetting process. So um, I think critical thinking and communications are pretty, pretty high up on the list. Teresa, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, I would like to add uh, to what uh, they've said. I would like to add um, the need for building social responsibility skills. In other words, bring up that awareness in, in young people. Uh, because we have um, situations where, you know, the younger ones uh, easily think that, okay, well, the problem of um, the, the burden of building society, the burden of solving you know, things is left to the adults. You know, they are the ones who, you know, mess it up in the first place. They are the ones who need to clean it up. But we need young people to begin to take responsibility for their own lives and for their own actions. And social responsibility, therefore, is not, you know, um, it's not a, a taking for granted thing. It doesn't, sometimes it does not come naturally. And we need to be able to bring this into the classroom, uh, it, both informal and informal classrooms. So let young people know that, look, you have a civic duty at a certain age. At the age of 18, you have a duty to the state. You have a duty to yourself, to your family, to your community. And by so doing, we bring in community services skills. How can young people identify for themselves the areas they need to come into? And that is the whole essence of social entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is not simply, you know, go out there, come up with a very beautiful idea, make money. Social entrepreneurship, you know, differs from entrepreneurship to the extent that it has to make a difference in society. You know, it, it, it impacts people's lives, it impacts development, it impacts change. And for us to achieve that, we need for young people to have skills in empathy. We need for them to be able to, you know, look at a scenario and say, Yes, I really want to you know, make a change here. And those kinds of scenarios are things that they have to identify by themselves because you can't impose it. So unless it's within them, you can't get it out. And so we need to bring them to that point where they are able to identify these needs in society. Even as they are also you know, advancing themselves, they need to know that their personal advancement is akin to the advancement of their communities and to their societies. And how they you know, give back matters. Again, uh, to that extent, we also talk of even philanthropic skills. A lot, you know, in, let me situate this properly. Within the context of Nigeria and Africa, we have very few people who think philanthropically. You know, you, you could be wealthy and your wealth is for you, your children and, and your family, and that's it. But we need to really have people begin to address these issues. Because without the resources, there will be no, you know, nobody doing anything. The good that comes out is because somebody puts the money where the, the art is, and say, look, you're wrong with this. I want to, to, to see this. I'm putting my money on, on, on this. So you go do it. So we need to have more young people thinking, you know, uh, philanthropically and, you know, taking the initiative to bring uh, about um, changes in, in society. So
So I've mentioned empathy. That's you know, it's a, you know, a skill set. In empathy, then social responsibility. I've also mentioned the. Um, I also want to reiterate what um, Alisa said about uh, communication. To that extent, I will talk about public speaking skills. Without it, you can hardly even you know let your position be known to to, to people. You can hardly um, argue your case. So we need for you know young people to have this. Lastly, I want to mention legal skills. This is very very important. We often take it for granted, but we need to bring these things into the you know, formal and informal learning spaces. Because I, I, I want to you know, believe that if we have a rich curriculum that really prepares uh, young people, like uh, Olumide said, if school is not preparing people to, to face the real life challenges they're going to meet, then school is really not meeting its needs. It's not meeting, you know, living up to its uh, expectations. It's not even living up to its name. So we need to have this school create formal and informal classroom spaces where young people can learn all of this. Legal, you know, it could be paralegal, it could be legal. Let them know that there are laws governing society and how they fit into these laws could actually spell, you know, success or failure in life. So we need to also be able to help them use these same legal provisions to help themselves in, when the situation arises. So I, I would rather that we have all of this to make education what it is. Let it work for people. For young people, and that is what we are talking about in human development. You know, it's so interesting that all of you uh, basically have mentioned that there has to be an experiential model of education that that would uh, prepare young people in Africa um, uh, for real life and for being empathetic and for understanding. Uh, what they're actually sort of walking into as they exit school. One of our, one, another of our Ashoka fellows, uh, who's also in Nigeria, says nobody's preparing young people to graduate. Like they are literally just going to school, and they're not having any way of of connecting what's happening in these in a kind of a rote memorization or a very sort of strict and disciplined educational system for what comes afterwards. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious, so this is I, actually my own background is in experiential education, which is a very American kind of way of learning. Um, but I'm curious how we get that uh, implemented or how you're seeing it work in, um, in the African context. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a, an example, like a very specific example of how we can uh, promote that or push for that? Yes, I, I have an example. The, um, for instance, even at primary school level, when we came up with the concept of the integrate, you know, uh, inclusive basic education center for uh, primary school um, children, people thought it, it, it's kind, you know, it's a bit too too much. Maybe they can't do it. But today we have a success story because the, the school has four major components: the formal um, academic uh, curriculum. It has the, the technical education curriculum, which you know within which they do um, ICT, that is um, computer education, and uh, even web designing as uh, skills. And then they, they, we have the social um, employment preparability and employability you know components, which you know prepares them to really look at the world of work, even as early as primary school, because then you can begin to you know, shape your thinking of what you want and what you don't want and what you know, the talents you have and that you want to develop. Then the fourth component is the community service component, where we bring in the parents teachers association and the children, you know, we have different forums that, of interaction that enables them to really come together and, and think and you know, know what to do for the uh, good of the community. In that way, we are also able to know and identify the needs of the communities that we are working with. So, and, and in, in all of this, we have what we call the um, lunch hour talk show. During the lunch hour talk show, we deal with issues of legal education. Like, we have what we call the guest parliament looking at some laws in Nigeria and how they think those laws are working or not working. And these young people come and they mm -hmm. have these debates. So, it is, it's, not, you know, it's not too much. It's not. Uh, like, um, oh, this is um, a bunch of, uh, you know, too many things, can it really work? No. It could actually be scheduled within a very good curriculum planning uh, format to, to really run precisely and the children will gain the skills that they need to gain. 
Teresa, are you doing that in a, um, a in a in a government school in a public school, or is that is that only available? Um, no, no, no. We are doing that, you know, uh, bringing in children from public and private schools. So it's not uh, okay. focused on only uh, uh, the integrated and the inclusive education center. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Alyssa, Hi, what is your experience of, of doing experiential education? Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that ALU is, is, is sort of founded on the premise that all of our learning is experiential and designed around real-world problems. So the most concrete example I can think of is in our data and decisions course. We have a, a course that's all about quantitative reasoning because we realize that this is one of the skills that we think every young person should have um, if they're going to make it in the 21st century economy is the ability to look at data, see trends, notice, notice, um, notice different patterns, and then to be able to interpret it and make recommendations based off of it. So one of the case studies that we designed for our students was um, right around the time of the Ebola crisis in Liberia and in West Africa. And what we decided was, okay, pretend that you are representatives or consultants for the World Health Organization. Think about what trends you notice in West Africa, what data points you would use to recommend for them what is the next country to be infected with Ebola, so to have an Ebola outbreak. And they did that using purely numbers based on da data that they had in different countries in the West African region. And what we saw was that students were able to accomplish, to accomplish a lot more learning in terms of mathematical and um, quantitative um, skills because they had the context that was very real for them, very concrete, and their work was just so much more enriching because it was a context that they were familiar with and an issue that was obviously um, is motivating because you want to solve it and you want it and you know that if <laughs> if this were the real world it would have real con it would have really impactful consequences so I, I guess that's just a small um, anecdote of, of the kind of the ways that we can make learning tangible for students um, is to give them the real case studies, give them the real situations where um, these skills um, matter and are applicable. Well, I think it even speaks to, uh, an example like that even speaks to what Teresa was talking about in terms of social responsibility, that by uh, having young people like participate in that kind of an exercise, they begin to recognize that it might be their responsibility to come up with solutions, um, Absolutely. problems that are real to them. Um, and, and just on another know. point to Teresa's point, um, absolutely we need to engage young people in, in solving social problems, but we need to also reiterate to them that their youth is not, is not an issue, right? It, in the African context, we have this huge problem of saying that, you know, you're young, sit down, <laughs> um, or listen to your elders, and which, are, which are all great, great mottos and, and values to have to respect your elders, but we have to empower young people to, and give them the confidence they need to solve these problems. So if a, if a young person has a solution or, or, or has an interest in solving these kinds of problems, we need to encourage that and, and, and hear them out um, so that they feel like that these issues are important, that we, do, that we do value their opinion, and that if they need support from us, that we're willing to give it to them in order to tackle those problems. Well, Alumi Day is a pretty young man who uh, found a way to solve a problem. What do you think, Alumi Day? How are you trying to uh, push for real-world experience? Okay. Um, um, most of the people that we deal with are people who have already passed through um, other types of schools, and then they come over to us because something is missing. You know, so we try to give them that missing component and. To do that, originally we were doing it like just every other organization out there, just basic classroom um, teaching. And we saw that it wasn't really working. But then we, we, we took them out one day for a field trip, went to an established press, a very large printing house um, here in the city. And um, the owner of the press allowed us to go around, you know, and then 
he, he spoke to the students, he, he gave them, um, they were able to interact with him, find out about the business of printing. And you know what? That day was like a turning point because as soon as people started thinking in terms of real world money, you know, and they saw the process. They saw how money was coming in and going out, and they saw how things were being done. Mm -hmm. And then they had the they were able to ask questions from someone who was actually practicing. And you know, the man also came down to their level. He explained in terms of um, how he started small and all of that. And you know, when people saw that, they 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 um, began to embrace it more. So. Um, from that day, we made that a compulsory component of our training. It, it became compulsory for everybody who comes over to um, our place. They have such things, you know. So um, I, I, I think it has been very effective. Um, most of our students, there are times when they don't remember what they learned in class, but they will remember what they experienced, you know, and you would be surprised at how they, they come and um, they bring those things up again. And I've, I found out that those experiences work far better than just the normal teaching. Um, now, go, going to what um, somebody said earlier on, I, I, I think somebody was talking about um, the, the, so, something about communication. Uh, th th that point, I wanted to add to it as well. Um, I, I, I think that social media, social media is one of the very important components that we should also be thinking about. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's one of the things that, that define the 21st century. And as schools, we need to start thinking of putting such components into the curriculum as well. Um, my cousin, my, my cousin was 11 years old, he came over from the UK and we were um, talking and I discovered he knew much more <laughs> about social media than I did. He, he could actually lecture me on many things like that. So um, with that I, I have decided to add that component into our curriculum as well because it's very useful to the workplace and I think it is something that um, should be integrated as well. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I mean, what what that really is speaking to is a an issue of of trying to stay updated. I really enjoy, I really liked what um, Alyssa said about the fact that they that they're really taking current affairs and and putting that into um, somewhat more like skill based uh, uh, education, but also like recognizing the new kinds of skills that are going to be necessary. So. The big question that I, you know, that comes from all of this is how do we solve the larger problem of, of formal education in in uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, all of you are are skirting around it, but how do we how do we push not skirting around it? You're providing alternatives to formal education or, or the systems that exist. Um, and where do you see the kinds of learnings that you're you're seeing in terms of the future of learning for Africa, how does that get applied at maybe a policy or a governmental level? Who wants to tackle that one? Um, I, I've thought <laughs> a little bit about it. I, I mean, I thought, I thought quite a lot about it and how do we achieve more holistic change. Um, for Because at the end of the day, our institutions are dealing with a drop in the ocean in terms of the number of people we can reach um, on the continent. There's, there's such a high demand. And I think whatever the solution is, it is going to be multi, like multi, multilateral in the sense that it is going to require government, social institutions, the community. It's going to require many stakeholders coming together in a collaborative sense. But, and I know that that sounds kind of like, you know, ponies and fairy tales, but it's it's because you know how how do we bring all these these wonderful stakeholders together? But it, it is going to require a bit of pressure from all ends. And community community organizing is sort of a key in this because at the end of the day the people who suffer the most from a poor quality education are young people. So we need to organize young people to demand better quality education. We need to organize parents um, because 
many times if it's if it's a public institution or even if it is a public institution, parents are the ones paying out of pocket for for this education. Um, and then we need to put pressure on government to to make policies that hold univer public universities to a higher standard, and and create the kind of policies that are going to put pressure on universities to deliver skill-based education. And then, like all, like because um, as Theresa mentioned, a lot of these things don't happen without resources. We need the private sector to to partner with our public institutions. And we need governments to create incentives for private institutions to, to invest in our own education system. Um, it's not going to be a situation, it's not a sustainable situation to have private education try to address this, this social need, right? It's a huge social need and private institutions um, may not be able, are probably not going to be able to solve it on their own. So we need private institutions to partner with, to partner with government, and we need community organizers to um, organize young people and parents. That's what I think. Teresa, I see you want to say something. Yes, I, I wanted to. Uh, in addition to all that she has said, which I, I totally agree with, um, is the I want to you know highlight a bit more the role of teachers in revolution. Hopefully, Olumi Day will be joining us soon. Uh, you know what? We were just actually while we were away from uh, being live, we were having a conversation about the the problem of collaboration and how we might be able to model um, really good ways of collectively solving education together. Um, and I, you know, maybe we can continue that a little bit. Teresa, I think you were just saying something right as we went online. Yes. I was saying that the reason why collaboration, you know, uh, hardly works is because most times it's a one or two day thing, and then after that everybody disperses, and that's the end of it. But if we could, yeah. you know, if Ashoka could convene a, a meeting of stakeholders, you know, and this time around, not just the social entrepreneurs, but you know, all the you know, of the stakeholders we've mentioned in this um, webinar, if we can have them in the same room. All we need to do is find very compelling common grounds to work on. And that will keep us you know, in touch with one another, especially in terms of projects that can really be implemented, which can also be shown as you know, an outcome of such an effort, you know, concretely. So I, I think yeah. if we could do that, that, that would really be wonderful. And yeah. I, I think uh, to build on what Teresa is saying in terms of making it a, a a long-term project. One of the one of the things that I've seen being be more successful is community organizing and really mobilizing young people and specifically parents um, to be more involved in the process of education reform. We need to build a movement that can that can put pressure on these different stakeholders. Right? We need to organize parents um, to sort of they they already see the issues with these schools. They already see the issues with education, but it's more about Training them and giving them a voice, um, and channeling channeling that energy to to put pressure on government and other private institutions to do something. Um, so, I would be really excited to see an organization that is committed to um, educate to, to to educating parents, but also just um, channeling some of that energy that I know um, they have. Mm. Yeah, we know that intergenerational tension, you mentioned it before, that the fact that young people feel like they have to be put into their place, um, or that they, like, um, in, in Swahili, the word kijana is almost an insult, um, and kijana is the word for youth, like that word can actually be used as an insult, um, is a real issue, and so, so figuring out how to, like, manage the intergenerational relationships, um, Maybe through creating movements or, or whatever um, is, I think, a key part of that collaboration as well. Um, Illumide, we were talking about we were talking about the the problem of collaboration and how we can make wide scale um, change in the education field, um, and maybe pot potentially thinking about some of the solutions that we've seen for for bettering uh, collaborative um, partnerships. Okay. Do you have anything to say about that? 
could you probably go on with the conversation while I try to... Sure. While you catch up. <laughs> yes, catch up with what is um, going on right now. No problem. Uh, do you guys... Let, we have about... About ten minutes left of our conversation. I'm wondering if you guys might want to be able, be asking each other a question. Um, as, in the spirit of collaboration, um, we you actually all three of you are representing rather separate sectors of of the learning fields. Um, from Teresa and her work in, in in lower education, primary and secondary. Illumide was like the at the tail end after a university and uh, Alyssa in the university. Maybe there's some kind of uh, question you have for each other um, about the work that you're doing. You sure. had questions before we went live. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Alyssa. Okay. I, I, um, I have a question for oh, Teresa. It looks like... Continue. Go ahead. Okay. Should I go ahead? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, go ahead. It little looks little like time. she she um she works with um, all of that. Um, I, she she was talking the other time about ways of getting teachers to be motivated, and I think that's very important. Um, some of the schools that we've been to, you know, for the Twin Academy Scholars Program I told you about earlier. Um, one of the things I observed was that many teachers were not properly motivated. So in a case where you're talking to a teacher who doesn't even see the point of <laughs> what you're talking about, you know, that, that can be very depressing. So it, it looks like you've done a lot in that line. What are some of the strategies you've employed to, um, to, to boost the morale and increase the motivation level for teachers? Okay, um, I'll just uh, you know like read them off. Uh, we, in terms of teacher motivation and uh, professionalization, we've tried to bring them all to bear by bringing teachers together in, in what we you know is called the teachers and educators for all assembly. So uh, when we come, we, we deal with development issues, and it has to do with all the issues we know that pertain to education and to the development of young people, such as we we'll cover issues even to do with reproductive health and safety, sexual, uh, you know, safety from sexual violence and all of those. And then, but in terms of the teacher, them, the teachers themselves, we actually conduct what we call the Teachers Institute for Social Inclusion, because that is where we deal with some of these, you know, problems we have all identified here. You know, and we bring the teachers to understand these issues to on the process of changing some of these, you know, uh, scenarios we have and um, bring them into the curriculum. So the Teachers Institute is run once every two years and we bring in teachers and they're actually certificated. We give them, we issue the certificates because very often we, tra we conduct this training in collaboration with other agencies. So hopefully maybe one of these days we'll do one in collaboration with uh, Ashoka. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we train them and the, the certificate is issued and they're very happy and proud of the certificate because they carry not just our signatures but also the signature of our, of our you know, development partners. And then, you know, so we find that this is a, a very good, um, what do I call it now, achievement for the, for the teachers who participate because it gives them an edge even, you know, when they have um, to seek employment elsewhere outside of the school system like in, uh, within the gamut of bilateral agencies such as um, maybe UN Women or UNICEF dealing with education of children, they, are, they become more qualified than their counterparts mm -hmm. who simply went to one teacher training school somewhere. So that is, you know, they, they value that. And then they also value the fact that we have what we call the teacher's tea. You know, it's teachers and educators assembly. So we call it the tea. And when we come there, I mean, we make sure that teachers have fun and they learn, and we encourage teachers volunteerism. So that's a, a third one. I've mentioned the institute, I've mentioned the uh, network, I've mentioned the, the teachers assembly, within which we have teachers volunteering for community service. You know, uh, like um, Alisa mentioned earlier, we, we need to also mobilize the communities. And when we have these teachers working within the uh, platform of parents, teachers, associations, you know, we are able to take them to the communities where they 
do the public speaking. Then we hold what we call uh, advocacy um, events, such as soccer events. And during the soccer events, teachers come on board to address the entire community in, in any location we choose and, and you know, deal with some of these issues. So in that way, teachers begin to find that they can actually function outside of the classroom. They can also actually function and become development agents in their own rights, you know, because very often they are limited to just, oh, come to this classroom, teach. You're teaching geography, teach geography and get out. So we, we make them to understand that it's beyond geography. You can actually be a teacher, you know, across borders, across subjects, you know, dealing with all these issues so that when your uh, students meet you outside of the classroom, you can help them. They meet you within the classroom, you can help them. And that is what we have been doing. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Elisa, you had a question. Uh, yes, it was it was for Olu, and I was going to ask because um, he mentioned that he serves a lot of the students who um, are graduates of universities, and perhaps students who um, didn't have the opportunity to go to university. So I'm wondering if if you had the opportunity to talk to universities directly, maybe it's university, public universities in Nigeria, what would you sort of encourage in a nice way, I suppose? What would you ask them to do better? Or what would you communicate to them as like some of your learnings um, having worked with these kinds of, st with these students? Okay, well, uh, um, I, I get to address um, university graduates or um, finalists a lot. Um, I get invitations to address them. And you know what? Of recent speak like that, what I just do is I first start by telling them the stories of the Ashoka Five. <laughs> I call them the Ashoka Five. Um, the, 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 you know, we won a competition um, earlier in the year and I got to meet four very incredible people. And usually I start by telling the stories of those people. And many times when I tell those stories and I mention their ages, that many of these university finalists, um, they, they, they suddenly come alive. Like, how can a 23-year-old guy be doing such amazing work? And then, you know, the average person is wondering, so what am I doing? You know, so that fires them up. And it also shows them that being young to be doing nothing, um, being youth shouldn't be. Did we lose him? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. Okay, well, he'll come back to that. <laughs> um, okay, can I contribute to the question? Uh, Alisa? Right. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of uh, also what um, the universities, you know, are, are doing and uh, what we need to be changing at that level, I, I'd, I'd like to speak to that, you know, a little bit. In, in terms of, like, getting the students themselves to look at how the classroom scenarios are in, in, within the, I'm speaking specifically about Nigerian universities. And, you know, where sometimes you find that the young people are so totally discouraged because of the, uh, you know, let's say the lack of teacher, you know, lecturer, student rapport in those places. Now, mm -hmm. that could actually be a gap that can Teresa, be Teresa, we're having a difficult time hearing you, I think. Um, can you hear me? Elisa, can you hear her? Yes, I can. Oh, she can hear her. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Well, I was talking, I was saying that, you know, uh, we, those gaps, you know, such as poor um, lecturer students' relations and the lack of facilities within the university campuses themselves could actually be opportunities for students uh, in tertiary institutions to move in and show their own talents as social entrepreneurs if they, are so, you know, if they so wish. So those are gaps that need to be filled. And... Generally speaking, in Nigeria, we don't have a, you know, good um, say classroom scenarios, even in, in tertiary institutes. And that is a real problem. It affects the learning, it affects the social interaction, and, and so on. So how can the young people themselves address this? Because 
Now, I'm emphasizing the young people and what they can do, because uh, over the years, we have always looked at what the government can do, what the schools can do, and they have done, you know, well, the little they could do. So, but how can the young people fill the existing gaps, you know? So, to me, I think if you can, you know, bring the young people you are working with to look at the gaps they find within their campuses and use those gaps as entry points into a social entrepreneurship. That is the point I'm making. That that would be wonderful and a way forward. No, I, I think you you definitely hit the nail on the head. It's it's exactly what you were saying. To give give to give students opportunities in their community to, to find ways of creating impact. So I know one of the things we do at ALA or um, with ALA students is they they have to participate in some sort of community action project or a um, student enterprise on campus. So we give students the room to run businesses um, exactly. on campus or to run social entrepreneurship projects outside of campus. So it's oftentimes they'll do volunteer projects or they'll, they'll identify a need in a community and they will run a project. Now, we can do that on a much broader scale. It doesn't have to be just within the, the school or the university. We as educators and parents can organize projects or can organize students to, to, or train them to think, to look at problems in their community and then think about um, how can you, as a young person and a few of your friends, like, get together and organize a community project. Like, we need to give students, like, the confidence to address these problems. And it is by, like, starting small, starting your community, and then work, help them um, see that they can make a difference. That's right. Um, hi, everybody. Lindsay uh, is having some technical challenges, so I'm stepping in here. Um, thanks for rolling with the punches with us. Um, I think Olu is back. Um, Olu, did you want to finish yes. your thoughts? Um, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I was talking the other time about um, young people realizing that being young is not an excuse to, to be doing nothing. And um, many times when, when you're... In, in fact, being young is an advantage, you know, and the funny thing is many times when you give people examples, then they, they get fired up and they, they see the potentials in, um, and they, they see the number of things that they can do. So I've tried it a number of times. I've realized that it's, it's usually very effective. You just walk them through a number of examples of people who are doing great things and some of whom are also doing those things without going through the normal societal processes. In our society, the average person wants to just finish school, get a job, get married, and go through life. And, you know, that's just it. But by the time you tell them that they can be much more and mm -hmm. um, they have better potentials, there's much more that they can achieve, you know, by taking some risks, starting small, letting it grow big, and stuff like that. And then you have wonderful examples to back it up like, um, Elaine and Ellen and those <laughs> amazing people, you know, you'd be surprised that many of them actually get fired up and I've had people who have um, started things based on such examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we, we at Ashoka, we 100% we echo and support all of that, um, like you said. Um, we had a Twitter question come in actually about uh, this point. Um, which was, you know, young people can get fired up. They can go ahead and have ideas and create these solutions. But the question is, how about funding? Um, I don't know if any of you have thoughts on that. Okay. So can I start on that? Yeah, go ahead, Olu. Okay, F funding. Um, well, really, funding is one of the biggest problems that <laughs> entrepreneurs face. But the truth is, many times people think that funding is the real problem when it's not. Um, one of the things that I encourage my students to do is to start small. Start with what you have. Start from where you are. Um, sometimes it's more important to have the knowledge and to start with that. And, and then you can grow it big. And you know what? Many of my students, as at the time they were coming in, some of them couldn't even um, afford the training. Well, you'd be surprised that for many of them, by the time they are halfway 
through it. They're already raising money to buy expensive cameras, I mean relatively expensive cameras and equipment and all of that. And, and so you find out that sometimes it's not so much about funding, it's about just getting started. When you get started, nobody is likely to give you a grant for just an idea you have in your mind. But they will give you money for something that has already started. So I, I, I think that for most people, they need to learn that it's, it's better to, to start first. And when you get it started, there's a way the world works, that people start to gather around you and they help you achieve your dreams. If you told me a couple of years ago that Twim Academy would be um, would be on the level that it is today, I would have argued with you because it wasn't looking like it at that time. Right. But you know what? I've learned that by starting, um, somehow forces gather around. Um, I've met, I've met um, Ashoka, I've met incredible people, and all those things have a way of just generating traction for you. So mm -hmm. if you don't get started, you'll end up doing nothing. Start first and then you will see that all the resources will come to play. And then one more thing. Many people think that the wise thing is to start big. It's not really wise. It's not very smart, um, at, at least most of the time, for, especially for young people. There are certain mistakes you are going to make. So if you start big, you're likely to fall very big. But if you start small and you fall small, you can start again. And so it's better to just start from the level that you are and let it grow with time. So I don't think funding should be an issue for anybody. Just start how you are. Right. Um, thank you, Olu. Um, so we're at time, but I just wanted to wrap up with echoing um, by saying something you, you, you said to me, actually, when we were doing an interview, which was um, to create value first. And once you create value, other people will see the value that you're that you're bringing to the table, and they'll be there to support you, which echoes exactly what you're saying. Um, another uh, an, another Ashoka fellow of um, uh, called Marlon Parker says something which also echoes the same uh, principle, which is create value first, and then think about capturing value. And that's you know at the heart of as an entrepreneur, what are you bringing to the table? How are you solving these problems? Um, and mm -hmm. after that, have you after you've been able to really refine your answer, um, you know, iterate on your solution. And then after that, you'd be able to capture value. Um, so I hope um, that's been uh, a, an answer to to our twi Twitter um, tw Twitter follower that was asking that question. Um, thank you all so much uh, for participating in this uh, webinar. It was quite uh, an engaging, dynamic conversation, and uh, really cool to have everybody from all across the continent, including an island off the side of the continent. Um, and um, uh, for those of you who uh, had tuned in, we did have technical challenges, so we will have two videos which we'll be sharing with you where you can re-watch, um, but then you can also follow the Twitter chat conversation to see um, what our participants were saying at uh, hashtag Africa Youth Forward, um, FWD. Um, and with that, I thank you all. Lindsay was not able to join us back in to, to say her goodbyes, but um, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, and tell Lindsay we said thank you as well. Okay, we'll do. Alright, bye everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.